Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Nine Point Partners Enhanced Strategy Update. I'm John Wilson, uh, the Lead Portfolio Manager, and uh, I'm happy to be with you here today, uh, take you through our views as to where market conditions are today, uh, some of the journey we've been through this year, uh, and uh, we'll update you on uh, the performance of the fund, what has worked, what has not worked, uh, and what we're doing um, in particular about things that have not worked. Uh, so with that, I'm going to jump right into the presentation that you have. We're going to um, skip over the nine-point general information and move right to slide six uh, and talk uh, about the recent market correction that uh, may or may not be over, uh, depending on who you talk to. I, I think um, it's been one of the more interesting um, corrections that we've gone through uh, during the, the, uh, the tenure up cycle we've been in. Uh, there were um, certainly over the course of the correction several different explanations trotted out by various market pundits about why we were going through a correction. I'd remind everyone you don't, uh, you know, sometimes corrections are as simple as the market testing to see whether we're at the end of a cycle and whether a recession is coming. And um, if it turns out we are, they'll look, the market will look prescient. And if it turns out we're not, uh, and they get evidence that we're not, then the market will rebound and it will look just like a correction. So uh, that's always been my opinion about corrections. It's a, it's a probing mechanism by the market to test uncertainties that market participants sense. And, and in my view, the biggest uncertainty that's out there um, for a lot of reasons is how long can this go on and uh, what does growth look like as we peer into 2019 and of course, even more uncertainly into 2020. So, you know, in, in the end, it comes back to what am I paying for in the equity market? Uh, how much growth do I actually think there is? Uh, and um, and are we approaching the end of the cycle, the next recession? Um, and there were some other uh, reasons for people to worry about that. Certainly, the global growth data has not been uh, terrific. It has been uh, slowing down uh, for a period of time, and we've seen that in the performance of emerging markets, uh, certainly uh, throughout this, the summer and into the fall, uh, emerging markets were vastly underperforming what was happening in the U.S. market. Uh, and uh, this latest correction in our view is just people saying, well, wait a minute, um, maybe there's a big global growth problem, maybe earnings aren't going to be what I think they are in 2019, and maybe I need to revisit all of those assumptions. Uh, interestingly, um, if you looked at the U.S. equity market and the Canadian equity market, uh, we've rebounded off the lows from late October, but the peak to trough drawdown was virtually identical in both markets. The uh, S&P uh, bottomed out around 2640, uh, and I think intraday it, it almost hit 2600. Um, the TSX uh, bottomed out around 14720 and was about 100 points lower than that on that same intraday move. Um, it was about an 11% drop uh, in both markets uh, over that that that. Uh, period in October. Um, at the lows uh, on our numbers, we had the U.S. equity market correcting back to uh, just under 16 times 2019 earnings. Um, of course, um, if you use consensus earnings, it was even cheaper than that. I think it got down to close to 15 times uh, the 2019 consensus number. Um, but there is, as I said, uh, a lot of people questioning that 2019 number right now. And depending on what assumption you use, you can get whatever multiple you want. Uh, Canadian equities, on the other hand, were, um, were cheaper uh, coming into that correction and just managed to get cheaper. Uh, being cheap was one of the lessons uh, that uh, you've, we've been learning through this cycle. Uh, cheap has not been uh, a way to protect against downdrafts. Um, in fact, there were selected industries that were very cheap on an absolute basis, uh, but actually realized more than average downside during the correction. So uh, cheap, uh, because you'd already been sold off, didn't mean that uh, you couldn't get sold off more in the, in the correction. Um, on the next slide, slide seven, we're talking about uh, uh, the performance of the fund, and we're not happy with the performance of the fund. Uh, we'll go through the elements of what drives our performance, but at the most simple level, uh, we have uh, equity holdings, uh, generally around 30 uh, large cap equity holdings that should drive our upside capture and then uh, we carry an option book that helps manage uh, our risk exposure, uh, that helps manage our downside capture. Um, the blend of those two mean we're never going to have 
you know, 100% upside capture because our downside tools we use will detract somewhat from that. Um, but uh, what's been uh, most frustrating and, and um, about this episode has been uh, actually the, the quite good performance of our downside capture tools. Uh, they've worked actually very, very well, and we'll go through some of the numbers on that. The challenge uh, really has been uh, the stock portfolio. Um, and, you know, and partially that has been our value orientation. We are, we are focused on uh, units of reward we can earn in a name based on value uh, relative to the implied risk. Uh, that, um, you know, is fundamental to how we look at upside downside in our portfolio. That's always how we've done it for over a decade and a half. Uh, that has not uh, been a good source of upside capture in this market, uh, particularly in the last couple of years. Worked very well uh, coming out of the correction, you know, or the uh, bear market in 09, right up through, I would say, 2015. It worked fairly well. Uh, but the last two or three years, uh, momentum and price have been much better indicators of stock performance. Uh, in particular, uh, and this is maybe not that surprising given how cheap Canada is relative to the U.S., but uh, Can Canadian names in our portfolio have accounted for virtually all of our problems on an absolute basis. So uh, where we have not captured upside and, in fact, where we've lost money has been on our Canadian uh, portfolio. Um, if you look at the U.S. portfolio, uh, we've certainly done better there than in the Canadian side. Um, we, we can't be as heavily oriented or as, um, as invested in the leadership in tech as the general U.S. indices are. So on a relative basis, <clears throat> that causes us some performance issues in terms of trying to keep up. But on an absolute basis, um, that was much less of an issue. Now, the relative challenge on our U.S. portfolio has certainly started to reverse fairly meaningfully. Uh, you've got Apple and Amazon both down 20% from their recent highs. Um, even uh, names that were very uh, top performers like NVIDIA, uh, NVIDIA at one point this year was up over 50% year-to-date and now has given back all of those gains. So um, the, t the tech uh, re re unwind, if you want, um, has impacted the, m the market uh, on the U.S. side more than us, uh, but our Canadian side is uh, unfortunately not helping us. Um, the market hedging book, we'll look at some slides in a minute uh, to look at its re uh, performance during down days and during the sell-off, but... Uh, our market hedging book has worked well and has uh, contributed to our performance in a positive sense this year. Um, that's actually fairly impressive given that for most of the year the market was obviously not down, so we were, we were, we were burning cost, uh, and yet we made that back and then some in, uh, in this most recent correction. Uh, and we still, even with that, have a fairly impressive uh, downside curve in place, so uh, we're, we're fairly heavily hedged here at these levels. Uh, and that's a function of two things. Uh, one, um, our drawdown has been higher than we want, so clearly we want to be more hedged uh, to, to inhibit further drawdowns. Uh, and secondarily, um, it's not entirely clear to us that we're, um, we won't test those lows again, uh, the 2600 level, which we do think should have some fundamental support. We are not expecting a recession at this point, uh, but it's not... Um, without possibility that we could double back and, and retest those lows. You know, one of the um, elements that has made this market fairly difficult is, you know, the increased um, contribution or <clears throat> uh, power of program trading, um, more automated type um, portfolio strategies. Uh, you, you see moves like, for instance, yesterday where uh, crude oil prices were down at one point over 8% on a day. It was a record move in crude oil. Uh, really not a lot of news. The crude oil had already been down a lot in the prior 12 days. Um, there's a lot of chatter about people blowing out positions, about program limits being hit, about quant strategies kicking in. Um, so, you know, the, this type of environment can lead to outsized moves one way or the other. Uh, and they are often happening without any fundamental news predicting them. So uh, our, our point of view on hedging is that uh, discretion is the better part of valor here, and we're, uh, we've uh, stayed heavily hedged uh, on the downside uh, with S&P puts. 
Uh, if you look at slide eight, <clears throat> sort of diving deeper into individual names in the portfolio, uh, I've tried to look at this uh, in sort of two groups. The top group um, is our U.S. Um, you know, key winners and losers. Um, not maybe surprisingly, the, the top performing sectors this year in the U.S. marketplace have been technology and healthcare, and those, uh, you know, the top two names in our U.S. side of the portfolio have both been a technology and a healthcare name, Pfizer and United Health. Um, the losers, uh, you know, has been one of the more frustrating uh, elements for us. Uh, among the cheapest sectors in the U.S. are financials. Uh, you know, we entered the year with a view um, coming into the year that the market was underappreciating how much the Fed was going to raise rates. Um, at the start of the year, the market was discounting one to two rate hikes. Uh, our view was at least three and maybe four. Uh, we've already had three this year. We're, we are, I think, 100%, the market's discounting now 100% probability of a fourth in December. <clears throat> and theoretically, that should all, as long as we have a healthy economy in the U.S., that should be good for American banks. Um, the evidence is that it, that it has been good for them. Loan growth is still uh, fairly decent. Um, uh, net interest margins have been expanding. Profits have been growing. Return on equity has been growing and yet the stocks are down on the year, um, and they were very cheap to begin with. So uh, that, uh, you know, uh, it made a lot of sense. I, I still am not exactly sure why that has played out the way it has, uh, but fundamentally that has not worked for us in uh, so far in 2018. Uh, the Canadian names are listed. Uh, next, we have, um, again, it's a technology company that's done well for us, CGI. It's been a long-term holding uh, of the fund. Um, and uh, has had another great year. Uh, but the losers have far outnumbered the winners in Canada, and, uh, you know, it, it's been a function of a, a couple of different types of challenges. Certainly energy has been an issue. Uh, we entered the year with a bullish view of uh, the demand supply curve for energy. Uh, that worked for almost... Uh, well, pretty much uh, the entire year up until about uh, two or three weeks ago. Um, oddly, as the Iran sanctions are, are set to kick in, uh, a bunch of rhetoric from Trump and others around OPEC supply has uh, turned the oil market upside down. We've had a sharp correction back in oil prices. Um, I, I think that will prove temporary. Uh, but regardless, even when energy prices were going up, crude oil prices were going up, energy names were not participating. Uh, so um, uh, it's been uh, frustrating. The, the names themselves we'll take a look at are quite, quite cheap uh, relative to anything else in the marketplace. Uh, and we do think um, they should reflect better value, uh, particularly once oil stabilizes again. Um, we'll, we'll take a look through a number of these names uh, on a deeper dive. Uh, financial is another big sector, um, as in the U.S., that has not worked in Canada. Uh, and then uh, uh, utilities uh, have not worked because of the rising rate environment. And similarly for our, uh, if you want to call it our REIT, but Brookfield property, our, um, our real estate play. Uh, if you look at uh, section slide nine, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the hedging uh, you get, this just shows that our drawdown on the U.S. fund that we run without Canadian exposure has worked much, much better uh, than uh, because we frankly don't have the detraction of those U.S. equities vastly underperforming. Uh, our U.S. stocks, um, you know, held in kind of as we expected uh, they would, and our hedging performed the way we hoped it would. Um, you see that uh, on a sort of even narrower view, if you look on slide uh, 10, we went back and looked at um, the spring correction uh, back in late March, early April, and looked at what our uh, performance on down days was. Uh, see the teal candle there is nine point, uh, our enhanced equity class. The gray uh, is the S&P 500 in Canadian dollars, and the blue is the blended TSX S&P index. Uh, I'd highlight one other point. Uh, we uh, always hedge currency in our fund. Uh, it's a source of risk, just as owning equities are. Uh, our blended benchmark does not hedge currency. Uh, and so uh, this year, that has also contributed about a, um, the, the Canadian dollars depreciated about a little over 
uh, versus the U.S. dollar. Uh, and so on a relative basis, we don't benefit from that depreciation since we hedge out uh, U.S. dollar risk. Looking at slide uh, 11, um, this just boils it down even further. And again, our, this is downside capture over that same time period for our U.S. fund. Uh, and again, we're the teal uh, candles. And you can see our downside capture was even better uh, because we didn't have the underperforming Canadian equities in that fund. Um, uh, I wanted to get into some name-specific, um, both you know, issues and challenges uh, and opportunities. Uh, Altagas uh, was a position that we had in the portfolio. It uh, is a utility. They've done a U large U.S. acquisition, uh, generating a, a fairly substantial uh, funds from operation yield, but uh, with the acquisition, um, you know, it, it has its focus on a number of growth projects that require capital uh, looking into next year and the year after. And um, they've taken on debt to do the acquisition. They had targeted uh, a number of asset sales to help delever. Uh, they've now targeted further asset sales to delever and fund that growth. Uh, it appeared obvious, I think, to most market participants that they would need to reorient the dividend uh, we did have conversations with them on that. Um, uh, one of the messages we had for them was that, uh, you know, it's important to be clear uh, that you are, uh, what you're going to do with the dividend. Um, unfortunately, they've not yet been clear. They, they did uh, report results, uh, but at the time talked about revisiting the dividend policy without giving any clarity as to what that policy would be. And as a result, you've had... Um, uh, holders, in particular retail holders, selling uh, um, the stock um, meaningfully down. So, uh, you know, I do think it's it's great value. I do think it's oversold. I don't. I do not think management has handled either the acquisition or communication around funding that acquisition very well. Um, but we have loss limits, uh, and they've been reached. So we are uh, in the process of selling that position. It's um, been sold and will be continued to be sold until it reaches zero. Um, second, uh, another name that has been difficult for us this year, uh, Manulife. Um, actually an interesting business with great growth in Asia, uh, a long-term liability book that should benefit from higher interest rates as global interest rates rise. Um, it, uh, you know, it did, similar to other financials, underperformed through most of the year, declining even as the U.S. market went higher. Um, it was then hit again by... Uh, a uh, report from a short seller named Muddy Waters um, uh, highlighting a lawsuit that we were actually already aware of uh, that's been out there for some time uh, related to uh, insurance contracts sold by Manulife and others. In fact, Industrial Alliance was another one uh, that sold these contracts um, decades ago that basically allow the, the policyholder to deposit cash with the insurance company and get a 4% cash return. Um, uh, a, um, a hedge fund of some sort has been buying up these contracts and is suing. Uh, effectively, what they wanted to do was um, claim that these there was no limit on the amount of cash they could put into the insurance company as a, once they held these contracts, and uh, effectively they could start a huge billion-dollar or multi-billion-dollar money market fund and have Manulife have to pay 4%, which would be well above what you would pay for those types of deposits. Um, uh, Saskatchewan's already recently passed legislation which effectively makes the lawsuit mute. Um, I, we've talked to several experts who don't see virtually any chance of the suit succeeding, but it did uh, manage to pull the stock down a lot uh, through uh, September and October. Um, the actual performance of the business itself has been quite good. Um, they had uh, strong double-digit earnings growth in the first half and that has been accelerating in the second half. Uh, they reported recently and beat their third quarter estimates. Uh, the return on equity has been rising pretty substantially over the past year. And as you can see on slide 14, uh, Manulife MFC is uh, trading down about one times book um, with an ROE just over 13%, which puts it uh, on the very cheap side of where other financials trade. Uh, and I don't think it's a surprise that both um, Investors Group and Manulife are below that line, given the, um, the the worries over the lawsuits that have happened recently. 
We do think those lawsuits um, are not going to re result in any material downside for the stock, uh, or sorry, for the companies. Um, and, and they should trade, Manual Life certainly should trade closer to 10 times earnings or 1.3 times book, uh, which would um, give you about a 40% return from here. Uh, the stock's actually hit a PE in the sell-off that was below where its earnings multiple was in the great financial crisis. So as bad as things were during 08 and 09, we got to a lower multiple uh, during this sell-off. It's just so unloved and, and abandoned, it's remarkable. In fact, if you look at um, comparable valuations for their Asia business, it implies that their core North American business at Manulife is trading at less than five times earnings, which, again, we think is ridiculous. So uh, that is a core holding for us. Um, we've actually grown the position, and uh, we um, intend to keep that one. Uh, I'm going to talk quickly on Canadian Energy on slide 15. Uh, it has been obviously, uh, and, and you know, we're not unaware that energy is always a volatile space. Uh, for every person who thinks oil is going to 100, there's another person you can find who thinks oil is going to 25. Um, our, our view had been really neither of those. We just felt that um, there was uh, a limit to the amount of oil that could be produced out of the U.S., and we we're quickly approaching it uh, right now until they expand pipeline capacity, which won't come on until about this time next year. Um, you have OPEC, which has actually been pretty good about holding production in line, and then you have Iran sanctions coming online. Uh, that combined with our lack of investment globally over the last three years as oil energy prices have come down was leading global inventories to drop meaningfully, and that had been underway for well over a year. Uh, and as that happened, that should um, balance oil supply and demand and allow oil to stabilize in that $70, $80 range. Um, and we were certainly there. Um, it's unclear, uh, I think, to a lot of people exactly what, what this recent sell-off has been, other than there was a lot of bullish positioning on the long side, and that seems to have reversed. But, um, you know, one of the bigger impacts in Canada has been the growth in the discount that Canadian oil receives relative to U.S. oil, or the, the heavy crude differential. Uh, that was $26 at the start of the year. Uh, a few weeks ago, it hit $50. It's recovered somewhat to about $40. And that, of course, is a function of the fact that we have very few ways to get oil out of uh, the oil patch in Alberta with, uh, with all these pipelines not coming to fruition uh, and approval is very difficult to get. Uh, crew by rail, uh, slow to come back online. Uh, it has caused uh, the discount to blow out on Canadian oil. Now, I guess I'll make two comments on that. Number one, uh, we actually don't own uh, any names with exposure to that heavy crew differential uh, in any meaningful way. Uh, yes, we own Suncor, uh, but they refine and have downstream, uh, so they're kind of vertically integrated and can manage to avoid most of that pain. Uh, we own other names that are exposed to Brent prices. They're offshore producers uh, in Latin America. Uh, so, you know, it hasn't mattered. All of the names that trade on the TSX and the energy space have been hammered pretty equally, um, but we don't think they, um, they should be. And, uh, uh, you know, we just have to wait it out. Our, our names are heavy uh, cash flow producers uh, with very good balance sheets and incredibly low multiples right now, even with the check back in oil prices. Uh, and we, um, we do believe that that will ultimately show up in a better share price. Uh, so, you know, energy has been, uh, without question, a difficult space, uh, but it does offer compelling value, and especially if we ultimately prove to be right on oil um, being more fairly valued between $70 and $80. Um, I want to talk quickly on money center banks on slide 16. Uh, effectively in the U.S., uh, we own two big money center banks, B of A and Citigroup. Uh, on the top left, you can see um, their, their corporate lending and retail return on equity has been better than the peer group. Uh, the productivity improvement, certainly for, uh, for both uh, on, on, on efficiencies, has been better than the peer group. And in particular for B of A, um, has been extra extraordinary. They've had a, a very strong efficiency program underway that's done remarkable things to their efficiency ratios. Uh, 
Uh, and yet both companies trade at meaningful discounts to the peer group. So, um, you know, the, the fun underlying fundamentals of, the, of both businesses have, have improved through, over the course of the year. The, both names were uh, cheaper than the peer group, and the peer group was already remarkably cheaper than the U.S. market, and yet uh, both have continued to underperform. Um, uh, I, I do think uh, the Fed will keep going with rates. I do think ultimately that will be good for the banks. Uh, I do think that uh, the U.S. economy is not tipping into recession. I think we're going to keep chugging along for a while. Uh, and um, once this scare gets over with, uh, I think there should be um, a re-rating re of, um, of the banks. Uh, and uh, I'm going to finish with uh, a quick look at uh, some of the things we've been adding to the portfolio. Um, we've been doing a number of things, but this is one example uh, where on the pullback in October, uh, tech, as I mentioned earlier, got hit particularly hard. Um, some of the leadership, uh, you know, think of the FANG names, uh, led the way back um, in terms of the pullback. Uh, we did uh, add some tech exposure on the pullback. Uh, really for two reasons. One, we didn't have a lot because it was hard for us to own the really expensive nosebleed stuff. Uh, uh, but secondly, um, changes in volatility in the option market allowed us to protect ourselves in owning that tech in a way that we found attractive. So um, we made meaningful additions to both the triple Qs and the IGV, the software ETF. Uh, and we wrapped those with an option structure where we sold calls that we're up 10% from where we put the position on. Uh, we bought a collar, uh, not quite at the money, it's slightly out of the money below us, and then um, um, sold another put down 10%. And effectively, what that ends up doing is um, you can own the, we could own those two ETFs, and if they rallied, uh, we would sell them once we were up 10%. Um, or if they sold off, uh, <clears throat> for the bulk of that sell-off, we'd be protected with our put spread. And if we wanted, we could uh, sell the in the money put and then just execute the, uh, the uh, sold put to, to own the position down 10%. Uh, it was a good trade-off in our view, either make 10% or buy more uh, or buy the position down 10%. Um, uh, now uh, that we did this position originally, I guess, two or three weeks ago when this uh, near the bottom of the sell-off, um, we had a double down uh, again once we'd done it in the first place, and that allowed the call to pretty much vaporize, so we covered it. So now we, we don't even uh, have the upside limit. We still have the downside protection, but um, we own both the triple Qs and the IGV without any upside call sold. So, uh, so that's what we're doing. Um, I've been doing this a long time. Uh, I've honestly never found it this difficult to make money owning value. Um, we are, uh, I guess, frustrated, though not throwing in the towel or we're not going to change the way we do business. We're not going to go chase um, momentum names. Um, you know, in the end, as um, frustrating as the year has been uh, and as much as we don't like being in the negative column for the year, uh, you know, we have yet, you know, yet to experience a real market drawdown. 10%, uh, 11% in the indices is not uh, a bear market. And, um, you know, our, our strategy is there to protect against those outcomes, uh, and we feel highly confident we can still do that. Um, in fact, we're very well hedged at this moment um, if we were to keep going down from here. Um, but, you know, ultimately we want to make money, and um, over time we've learned the best way to make money is to own cheap names, get the thesis right, and own them over a period of times, so we're not high-frequency traders. We don't grind and you know turn positions every two weeks. We generally find good names, find them cheap, and own them over a period of years. Uh, and um, and that's what we intend to keep doing. Uh, so with that, I'm going to uh, jump to some questions. Um, we got uh, three or four here that I wanted to get to, uh, and in no particular order. Um, well, I'm going to start with this one just because I effectively just touched on it. How much downside presently exists in the protection curve? Well, uh, we own, uh, and I should, you know, our, our curve in terms of what we own, these are options. So every day the market moves, every day the value of the options move, uh, options expire, so we're constantly rolling some of our options. I mean, virtually almost every day some, we're doing some option trade or other. 
because we don't have, it's not like we have all of our puts in one position. We have them spread uh, over different times and at different strike prices. So all of that to say, um, the curve changes day to day. Uh, generally, uh, we, when we're looking at the curve, which we obviously do every day, uh, we're most concerned with if we move down two and a half, five, ten percent from here, um, where what happens to the portfolio? And uh, we, uh, you know, when we make those assumptions, we're making some assumptions about how our equity uh, book is going to perform, and assuming that. Um, well, we, we, we effectively know that our option book should perform pretty close to the way we have it modeled. Uh, and um, so right now we have a very um, flat curve, I guess is the best way to put it, in terms of downside exposure. Should the market drop a lot, we should not capture much of that downside. That does assume that our equity book only goes down as much as it should go down, not, not a lot more. Um, given that we've already gone down a lot more than we should have, I, I, I would think that's a reasonable assumption um, in terms of our equity book, but, uh, you know, never say never. Uh, so, you know, we would consider our current positioning to be very hedged in terms of where we would normally uh, find ourselves. Certainly, if we were, uh, you know, uh, 5 or 6% higher, we wouldn't feel the need to be this heavily hedged. Uh, but we are watching it closely. Uh, we are managing it closely, and as I mentioned earlier, we've been effective in terms of managing the cost of that. It's been a positive contributor uh, for the year. Um, next question. There's a lot of chatter in the business that the next market crash, which many think is imminent, will be the worst ever. Many predicting a 50 to 70 percent drawdown. What is your position? How do you intend to mitigate such a collapse? Um, well, I, I, uh, I guess I would not be in that camp at this point. Uh, that doesn't mean things can't change. Uh, but I, I don't particularly see what would be uh, the cause of that. I, I guess I can give you one thing. Uh, I do worry about market structure. You know, I spoke earlier about the implication of program trading. Uh, certainly with ETFs tying together large chunks of the market uh, and implying a level of liquidity that may not exist in a sell-off there is a potential for a, a major flash crash again uh, where programs and quant trades uh, kick in and with, um, if people withdraw from the market uh, because of fear, ETFs could take the market down a lot more than it would need to. Um, what the cause of that would be to get people fearful, I, I don't particularly see anything right now, but of course the world can change relatively quickly. Uh, so that, that may happen. And in, in terms of what normally causes bear markets, which is recessions, um, you know, there's a lot of concern, as I spoke to earlier, <coughs> uh, with the global growth and people worrying that the, the world is slowing down as interest rates rise and that ultimately that's going to cause a global recession. I personally don't, I haven't seen enough evidence on that now. I think the U.S. remains relatively strong. Certainly Canada's economy has been relatively strong. Uh, and um, interest rates have risen. Uh, ultimately, we will rise, continue to raise interest rates until we do get the next recession, but our best guess is that's not now. It's probably not next year either. Uh, so I guess I'm saying we're not probably going to get that. Uh, as to how we protect it, um, I mean, uh, you'd always like to be predicting something when it happens, but... Uh, this is one of the reasons we always have foot protection. We don't um, t try and time the market that way. We don't say, oh, we're, we're not going to spend money on puts right now because we're bullish, so we'll put them back on when we're worried. Um, you know, there are funds that do do that, sort of tactical positioning. Uh, we're not one of those. That's why we're always running a curve, and that is our protection regardless of how far the sell-off goes. Um, I mean, our, you know, from a relative position, uh, you know, as, as bad a 50, 70 percent drawdown would be for the economy and everybody, that would be actually quite good for us. Um, not that I'm wishing for that, but uh, but we certainly would benefit from a, a large book of downside protection that we generally carry. Um, uh, third question: uh, Currency, specifically the U.S. dollar, seems to be strong, which has not been good for commodities in Canada. Could this change next year to help your positions? Um, 
You know, it's a great question. Um, the U.S. dollar, uh, you know, fundamentally commodities are obviously denominated in U.S. dollars, so a stronger dollar implies a, a cheaper commodity. Um, I, I don't think that has been by far the biggest contributor to the underperformance of commodities uh, over the last uh, number of years. Certainly, uh, it hasn't helped. Um, but, you know, the, the bigger issue is the slowing of growth in China. And, you know, if you think of um, metals, um, the, the shift in the Chinese economy away from fixed investment towards consumption, um, the, um, you know, the growing uh, belief that ultimately everyone's going to drive an electric car, that's certainly been an overhang for the oil market. So, you know, there have been a number of sort of larger macro demand-oriented issues that, to me, have been um, a bigger effect on commodity prices. And, of course, the flip side is there's been a lot of supply. They, you know, uh, when bull markets happen in commodities, a lot of supply gets put in, into the ground, and that generally takes a number of years to work off. And uh, we've, been, we've been doing that for the last number of years in metals and for the last three or four years in, um, in oil and gas. We do think of all of those oil and gas uh, is, a, is still a long way away from being meaningfully affected by an electric vehicle uh, phenomena. Uh, and in terms of supply-demand balance, we do think that comes that's in balance now and is likely to go uh, to an undersupplied position as we move into next year. Uh, so, you know, I think it's less the U.S. dollar and more, um, more just fundamental supply and demand that will ultimately uh, make a commodity bet work. Um, uh, final question, should I hold uh, enhanced equity or switch to enhanced U.S.? Is it better to continue to hold enhanced and wait for potential larger recovery here or consider the larger downside water under the bridge and move to the U.S. version for better downside protection from here on? Um, so I understand. So basically, I think what, the, uh, what, what they're asking is uh, the U.S. enhanced fund has had better downside performance than the enhanced equity fund, which I showed in the slides earlier. Uh, and as I mentioned, the reason for that is fairly simple. It's, it doesn't own Canadian stocks, and Canadian stocks have been virtually our entire problem. Um, and I, you know, uh, I guess I, I would answer the question this way. I'm not sure you're going to like the answer, but I, I continue to hold the Canadian stocks. Uh, I think they're r ridiculously cheap. I, I don't understand necessarily why they've underperformed as badly as they have. Um, they are thoroughly unloved. Uh, you know, Canada outperformed the U.S. for 10 years. It's now underperformed the U.S. for 10 years. Uh, so if you believe in cycles, we've got to be near the end of this one because the underperformance has been remarkable. Um, so, you know, that's, that's my view. Um, but I, I would say that, uh, you know, the track record on, on the U.S. fund has certainly been a lot easier without... Um, Without uh, the kind of vast underperformance, you don't see that in U.S. names the way you do in Canadian names. So I would understand why someone might consider that switch, but personally, I, I do expect these Canadian names to make up ground, uh, and um, and that's why we continue to hold them. So with that, uh, I'm going to end the webcast. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us, and as always, if you have any questions or would like further clarification, please reach out to our sales representatives and they can either uh, answer your question directly or uh, get me involved and I'd be happy to do that as well. Thank you.